began to question her about uh, the, the, uh, the missing child. Uh, why is that not a, a custodial uh, environment? Well, if you look at the trial court's order, he began, even with the universal interview, goes through a blow-by-blow -blow analysis. And when you look at the, the manner in which she was summoned, this was the very next day after the Anthony's had reported that we had a missing child. We had Kaylee Anthony was missing, so the officer just following up on the story given to them by the appellant. They go to well, clearly they had at that point uh, uh, manifested a uh, strong suspicion about the answer she had given to the prior questions, and clearly they had a hypothesis, I believe that they articulated about what had happened, that perhaps it was an accidental death, and what, wasn't there some mention that the child is either in a dumpster or buried somewhere? What, didn't one of the detectives raise that at that, at that, well, I mean, at that point? Well, I mean, they clearly knew that her story was not adding up. They called and said, will you come down to Universal? Because the officer, Detective Mellick was at Universal and had tried to confirm the fact she worked there, which was part of her story, and the fact that she had not. He was talking to the supposed supervisor. So she's asked, not seized, but asked if she will come down to Universal and does, and they proceed to follow her as she leads them on the tour of Universal. When she finally turns around and says, you know, I don't work here, they stepped in and did discuss with her, why is your story not adding up? I don't know if, I mean, they know that they can't find Kaylee at that point. They're trying well, I to. I mean, I'm, am I wrong about, correct me if I'm wrong about the facts, but I thought that, that they, they also uh, said to her, well, we know that she's either, we think she's either in a dumpster or she's buried somewhere. And you, you know, you might know her whereabouts. Didn't, didn't, they, con didn't well, they make that comment to her? They make the various comments trying to poke holes in her story as any officer will do during any kind it of was a, It was an interrogation. It was a classic textbook interrogation that was going on. The only question is whether she was in custody, right? Well, <clears throat> again, Miranda has two aspects, custodial and interrogation. Unlike the discussion at the Anthony home, this was a more of an inter interrogation right. type tactic. But back to custody, which is you know, the, what the trial court found right. had not occurred in this case. She's not summoned, she's asked to come and she does voluntarily. Why? Well, because but, we're but, but hold on a second, let me just interrupt you because she went voluntary to Universal. As I understand it, at some point in time, the police escorted her into the interrogation room where she was interrogated. And, and, and that was not, that was something that she was, esc she was asked to come to the, to that room so they could talk to her in privacy, right? Well, in other words, what was a, what was a, what was a, uh, a, a voluntary uh, trip to uh, Universal can turn into, can certainly turn into a custodial situation. Because, That's really the issue here, right? But the reason we're at Universal is because she submitted to the officers right. who were investigating her story that she worked there. And the officers are there with her basically to review blow by blow the various aspects of her story. Right. As her story starts to unravel, you know, she turn, she's the one that turns around and says, hey, I don't work here. And they say, let's step in here and try to get, you know, let's get your story straight. <coughs> and they go and yes, there are, is part of the interrogation of, hey, what is going on here? Where is Kaylee? Okay, What's but I mean, take me from that point, from the point in time that they, that they, uh, they poke holes in her story. She admits she's lied. They escort her into that room. What? What factors in your mind bear upon the, the, the fact that that's a non-custodial situation? Well, looking at the trial court's findings, he says that she was not summoned. She was asked to come there to continue her story. What are well, they well, there but, for? But she, she was asked to come to Universal, right? She was, at the point in time that she was escorted to the room, that was, that was well, more I mean, like being summoned, wasn't it? She's there, they step in here and say, let's talk. I mean, they're trying to find Kaylee. They're still, I mean, Detective uh, Malik is with the missing persons division of law enforcement. He is here trying to piece together her story. And Was she when, free to leave? Um, she left. Uh, when you look at the last finding is the judge found she was free to leave because after her story didn't add up and after this continuation and after she did not tell them what happened uh, to Kaylee, the, they say, well, let's go down to the station and let's look at, I mean, the suspect at that point was Zanata Gonzalez. 
she comes down to Zenaida to look at flyers or photos of Zenaida and comes freely down to the station. And then as her story continues. How did she get to the, to the police station? The officers who gave her transportation to Universal. Uh, took her to the police station. Took her to the police station, right. at which point she was eventually arrested. So the trial court found that under these facts there was not custody. She is being interrogated. Her story is unraveling step by step by step, and it's shifting from we're missing Kaylee and concentrating on suspect Gonzalez to you know why is she telling us lie after lie after lie after lie? So I mean yes, the officers have concerns, but the initial concentration, the initial focus of the interview is on why is your story not adding up? Where's Kaylee? Then as her story continues to unravel, you know, if you look at the four, four criteria, what's the purpose? The purpose is to find Kaylee. The purpose is not to accuse the appellant. The purpose is to say, hey, your story's not adding up. Tell one us the one of the criteria is the purpose of the interview. Is that the purpose of the question? Purpose, place, and manner um, of the questioning. Right. And but at the point in time that they knew she'd lied and uh, they, they escorted her to the room, the, the purpose of that of that discussion of those questions was uh, that that uh, she was a suspect in the in in the disappearance of this little girl that the police expected were uh, or uh, had hypothesized was dead and they were questioning her about her knowledge about that well, right? i think detective mellick had stated that uh, <clears throat> he suspected that she was lying he did not see her as the suspect at that point and you know, and he there was a, an exchange at length during the hearing as to what exactly the word suspect meant. Is she a suspect for lying? Obviously, again, whatever elaborate story she. These probably were pretty smart policemen. I suspect that by the time that they got her into that room, they were highly suspicious. Well, I don't think police officers have any patience for people who, from point A to point B, right. don't tell any truth to them. And this is the mother of the missing child. Her story child. didn't make any sense. Her story Aspects of her story had been. She had admittedly lied, and then they started to question her about their hypothesis that, that the little girl had had been killed or had died <laughs> through through some accident, perhaps. And, I mean, right? I mean, they look at the scenarios you're throwing out. I mean, they're doing classic interrogation type tactics. Right. You know, hey, did it, did she die accidentally? Did she die here? If you look at even the conversation um, in the Anthony home. He says, hey, do you have a drug habit? Do you have any kind of exposure to being you know, treated for drugs, these kind of things? That's, that's standard conversation with an officer when he's dealing with someone whose story is, is again, starting to, to not add up. Um, so there's a lot of people who have a, uh, interviews with officers who don't ultimately, are not ultimately charged with murder of a child. Uh, he knows her story's not adding up. Where the, where the story ends, uh, you know, no one knew at that point. Uh, they're still looking for the body for months and months and months until six months later. So he has concerns her story's not adding up, but whether she's in custody and the purpose, the purpose of why she was br brought down is to, hey, let's confirm her story. Yes, at the scene, her story unravels. She doesn't work for Universal. Um, the two people she named, Juliet Lewis and Hopkins, don't work at Universal. I mean, yes, her story's falling apart, but to say that she is now a suspect for murder versus a suspect for a liar whose story is not adding and up. And what, what was it that the police learned between the universal interrogation and the police station that caused them to decide to arrest her? What, what new information did they discover? I think the continuation, um, I don't know much, you know, it's not really. There, there was no confession or no physical evidence that they uncovered. There was not, no, no piece of telling evidence that they discovered, right? They just got her to the police station and that's when they decided was the best time to place her under arrest, right? Well, but they arrested her for lying. At that point, they had additional confirmation right. through her actions at Universal. But I mean, they had that same information when they were questioning her at Universal, right? Well, as she continued, as the story developed, yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, they could have arrested her. They had probable cause to arrest her at Universal. For providing false information at that point, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but just because you have probable cause to arrest someone doesn't mean they're in custody. A lot of people, you have probable cause to believe that I can go arrest someone, but they're free to go, and you arrest them well, days, well, weeks. let me talk later. to you about that. Let me ask you about that free to go. I mean, free to go when you've been driven all these miles in a police car and you don't have your own car there, and you don't have any way of 
of leaving other than with the police, uh, uh, that's not exactly free to go, is it? Well, I mean, the officer tested, the, the judge found she was free to go. She did leave and go to the station. Well, she was free to go where the officers wanted her to go, she, which she was the police station. She could have said, I'm going to go station, home. Right? I'm tired of this. You know, you've got me. I'm a liar. Take me home. She didn't ask that. She could have asked to drive mm -hmm. her own car down. Um, the, <coughs> the officers were sent down and uh, brought her down to Universal. But, again, the judge found there were sufficient facts and found I, that she was free to go. Well, I mean, if she was free to go, uh, if she had elected to go home at that point and they already had the information that they needed to to effect an arrest for lying, they probably wouldn't have taken her home. They probably would have arrested her. I mean, isn't that reasonable? Isn't that reasonable uh, under these facts? Well, I mean, at that time they had uh, a sufficient facts to suspect that to support the fact she was lying to them, and we had a missing child. As the story evolves, I don't know if they you know, they don't know at that point what we know at, at this point. Um, they have concerns. They're mad at, they're upset at her probably because they're trying to find Kaylee and Kaylee's missing and she's not cooperating. There's a lot of people that don't cooperate that don't get arrested. Um, there's a lot of mothers who don't cooperate. Um, there's a lot of you know, missing children in the news and the mothers and pa parents and family are not the most cooperative. What we knew at that time was she was a liar. We didn't, I mean, and we ultimately, that's what we convicted her of. The, the convictions spin out of the conversation when the officers arrive to the Anthony home, she tells story after story after story after story. Then she gives a written statement. <coughs> then Detective Melick arrives, and she gives a taped statement, which she then swears to. Um, really, all the universal statements, which if you have concerns with universal and with the custody, all of that would have been post, I mean, the lives were completed. All well, I, did, did any of the charges that she was convicted of arise, arise from the, uh, what occurred at Universal? They, they're charged as providing false information to Detective Malik, which she does at the Anthony home, and she continues to do, and they all occur the same day, and that's the way they're charged. All, all of the charges are, are based on the same day? Because Malik arrives at about 3.30 a.m. on the 16th, and then later that same day is when she arrives at Universal. Well, but the specific crimes charged weren't factually one of the statements were made at Universal and the other three false information, didn't they arise from the initial interview at the Anthony home? Well, if you, the four statements are um, that I work at Universal, which she told the first night, that I gave Kaylee to Zanata Gonzalez, she gave the first night, that the only two people who knew about it were Hopkins and Lewis, she gave the first night, and I talked to Kaylee, which she gave the first night. She spins and adds to her story as, as every interaction. Uh, Detective Mellick talks to her initially. He then takes her to the Sawgrass apartments, and she points out where uh, allegedly Miss Gonzalez had lived or where she had last seen Kaylee, that type of interaction. And then later that same day at Universal, she continues this story and says, this is where I work. This is, you know, I gave my cell phone. I recorded my missing cell phone. I mean, her story gets more and more detailed as she tells it. But the four charges come from, you know, the. <coughs> All right, <coughs> counsel, you've exhausted your time. Thank you. We ask that you affirm. Mr. Fryer, let me go back to the, uh, I mean, the, the questioning or the, the statement after the handcuffing at the at the Anthony home. Now you had indicated that if it was three weeks, it might be a different result. Would you agree with that? For instance, if after the handcuff and they released her and the police left and came back three weeks later uh, under Ramirez, you'd get a different result, right? Yes, Your Honor, probably. Okay. Likely. I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, looking at the, the Ramirez factors, um, the location of the question was at her house. The purpose was to, the trial judge found was to find the missing child. The, uh, it was a conversational tone. There was no confronting with evidence of guilt. So, I mean, under the Ramirez factors, I mean, you're not relying on Ramirez for the, the, the question at the Anthony home, correct? You're relying on the fact of the handcuffing. I am, Your Honor, I, Ramirez comes into play in that, Your Honor, but I would, I would say it's actually under that Melton analysis for arrest that, and then. Okay, but applying the Ramirez question. factors, you would lose at, at the questioning at the Anthony home, if you leave out the handcuffing. Uh, if you leave out the handcuffing, 
Um, Your Honor, for, for purposes of today, if you, leave, if you leave out the handcuffing, then you, you still have an oppressive police presence, but the handcuffing is a clear line of demarcation. It's, a, it's an arrest. It's a formal arrest. So moving forward with that and then the subsequent and immediate questioning after that is a custodial interrogation. It's an uh, interrogation so you, after you're arrest. You're not contending that every time a, a, an individual is handcuffed that they're under arrest. They may be detained, and they certainly might be arrested. That doesn't per se create an arrest, does it? Correct, correct, Your Honor. Correct. Well, if the police came back three weeks later after the handcuffing, I mean, you probably lose. So. I, I, yes, Your Honor. I'll, I'll two weeks. You know, potentially yes. One week. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I this this is a difficult it's for me to define the parameters of when there's been enough simple evaporation of. Here there was so. one hour, right? Pardon? Here there was one hour. Between there was uh, approximately, okay. approximately. However, and under the Ramirez factors, you know, without the handcuff, and you probably fail on all four factors. So you're really relying on the one hour versus the three weeks or two weeks or whatever. Uh, in terms of time, Your Honor, I wasn't relying on that. I, I really, quite literal. So I was sticking to the, the facts in this particular case. So, in this particular case where there's there's been the arrest, there is constant police presence where, based on the record, she was never outside of about 10 or 12 feet of an armed officer. We have multiple officers in her home. An interrogation happens in a private room at the home. Under those factors, it's a custodial setting and, and an interrogation. Okay. Now, prior to the handcuffing, she had given a written statement, including yes. pretty much these same statements. Does that uh, factor into our analysis at all? No, Your Honor. Not, not today. The, the, in terms of the the, what she was ultimately found guilty of, it was very specific. It was to Detective Melich on a particular date. So I, I didn't factor into the analysis all of the, all of the interactions that happened before that. I, I really picked that clear line of demarcation between what was potentially, could be characterized in multiple ways, but where there but was would, that would that Would that suggest that it was a voluntary statement on her part rather than a coerced statement? since she had given the same statement pretty much shortly before the handcuff. I'm sorry, Your Honor, what's the question? Well, she gave a statement in writing before the handcuffing. And then an hour after the handcuffing, she gives a very similar statement. So does that suggest that the second statement was voluntary, not coercive, since it was you know, consistent with the statement she gave before the handcuff? Quite the opposite. I'm about to run out of time, Your Honor. Would it be possible to answer that question? Sure, oh. sure. Qu quite, quite the opposite. What the, the issue that's addressed in Miranda and the subsequent decisions is the coercive atmosphere, the coercive atmosphere of an in-custody interrogation. Um, after the arrest, she's in her last place of refuge. She's in her home in the back of the house with the detective questioning her. It's more coercive. It's, it's less voluntary. That's, that's precisely when Miranda needs to be read to an individual. All right, ma'am, thank you so much. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate the argument. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll call the next case State versus Justin Foster.